right, how you guys doing this afternoon? Yes, awake, alert, I love the noon service. So glad that you are here. Uh, if this happens to be your first time here, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Brad. I'm one of the teaching pastors. And uh, as you come back, you're going to realize here at 242, we love doing everything as teams. And that includes the preaching here. So when you come back, you'll see some other uh, communicators on this stage. But, but I'm excited to be with you all this afternoon, sharing with you this week as we're kind of wrapping up this series called RPMs. Um, and I'm also excited to share with you all that we are a week and a half away from the Winter Olympics. Yeah. You're like, why? why does that even matter? Let me tell you why that matters. I made a grave mistake this summer, okay? I'm not proud of this moment, but, but I made a mistake this summer that has haunted me for over five months now. I introduced my daughters to the movie Cool Runnings. <laughs> this movie blew their minds, okay? They watch this movie, they're like, Dad, is that you? <laughs> Are we Jamaican? <laughs> like, like, no, 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 no. But they watch this movie. And, and, and then my oldest daughter found out that this is an Olympic year. And so she's just like, oh, that's going to happen? The, the Olympics are going to happen? We're going to see bobsledding? Like, the, like, you would think that Santa arrives in a bobsled, how exci excited these girls are. For five months, like, is it today? Is it today? Is it soon? Is it tomorrow? Is it next week? No. But they're so excited for the Winter Olympics. And I don't have the heart to tell them how boring it's going to be. I don't. <laughs> They saw the movie. They think it's going to be enthralling, but it's not. I know that. Because here's the thing. I personally, I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with the Winter Olympics. I don't get it. Okay, I'll keep it 100% with you. I don't get it. Summer Olympics were cool. Okay? Summer Olympics makes sense to me because everybody in the world runs. And then at some point you realize, oh, I'm running faster than everyone else. I'm talented at running right? Or, or everybody in the world throws stuff. And then at some point you realize, oh, I can throw stuff farther than everyone else. I'm talented. How in the Winter Olympics do people realize they're gifted at half of these events? I mean, literally, think about it. The luge. Hey, mom, dad, look. <laughs> no, no, no. It's really, uh, really good. Watch. <laughs> Sign that kid up. <laughs> I'm like, like, there's some kid in the kitchen, like, doing his, like, chores in the evening. He's just like, shh, 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 That kid's destined for gold. Like, they, these aren't sports or hobbies at best. Like, this is... Anyway. Um, but with the Summer Olympics, the Winter Olympics have in common, and what I would say each and every one of us in this room have in common is a desire to be better. I mean, these Olympic athletes, they want to be the best, um, but I think it's innate in every human being that we want to improve our situation. We want to be better, whether that's better at work, being a better husband or wife, being a better parent, whether that's being a better on the golf course or as some craft that you do, whatever it is, I believe all of us have an innate desire to better ourselves. And it's out of that overflow, it's out of that thought that we came up with this concept of this series of how are you living your life? And, and if you want to have a better life, do you even know how to have a better life? Or specifically, do you know where to target to have a better life? And so as a staff, we've been talking over this, this topic and, and basically we had this kind of internal language that we've been using for years, almost a decade now, where we ask each other, hey, how are your RPMs? And when we say that, we're not talking about cars. When we say that, it's an acronym, RPMs, it stands for how are these four areas of your life? How are you doing relationally, physically, mentally, and spiritually? Because we kind of feel like God wants us to be healthy in all of these areas. We see that in scripture. We believe that, that God, that, that for each of us, like if we get, you know, if we're redlining in one of these areas, usually that affects the other areas. And we think that is the way maybe we should talk about as a community, how are we doing getting better at living our life? How are your RPMs? So if you missed any of the weeks up to this week, you can go back on YouTube and you can watch those and catch up uh, later on this week. But for my time today, what I'm gonna talk about is that final letter there, the S. And that stands for spiritually. So the question I have for you today is how are you doing spiritually? Now, we're in church. 
on a Sunday and you're here. So you're like, I know it's noon, but I made it. Get off my back, okay? I'm doing good, all right? I'm doing pretty good. I made it to church. Um, But here's what I would suggest. Is that really spiritual health? Is that the pinnacle of spiritual health? Do you think that's gold medal spiritual health? Because what I see is that's just the beginning. And at 2.42, you're gonna hear us all the time talk about taking your next steps with God because we believe that whether you're eight or 80, everybody has another step they could take to be closer to God. And so when I say, how are you doing spiritually? I want you to be honest. How am I doing spiritually? Not just where am I an hour a week? How am I doing at connecting with God in my life? Because there was a study done a few years ago that shed some light on that question. How are we doing spiritually? And if I'm being honest, the results were dismal. This study uh, surveyed Christians, Christ followers, people who go to church who say they love Jesus, right? We're not talking about people who are atheists or you know, skeptical. We're not talking about people who are outside the church. This study sur- surveyed thousands of people who claim to be followers of Jesus. And what they found was this. About 50% of those people could not name the four gospels in the Bible. of those people could only name five of the 10 commandments. And 70% of those people believe that God helps those who can help themselves is in the Bible. Some of you in this room right now are like, it's not. (laughs) I'm not trying to call you out if if you fall into these statistics because chances are you do. What I am trying to say is that is a problem for the church. Not you are a problem, that is a problem that we need to be men and women who want to grow spiritually. And and if we're attending a a, a service once a week, the the survey says we're not accomplishing that just by being in this room. In fact, that survey went on to study what are the mechanisms, what are the ways that people can grow best spiritually. Unfortunately, uh, it was not singing songs about Jesus. That was not the ideal way that people grew spiritually. Can you believe the study said that listening to sermons was not the best way to grow spiritually? I don't think they heard more of my sermons, but I just, they just, in general, in general, they said, don't listen listen to sermons, not gonna do it. Would you believe it even says having an active prayer life is not the ideal way to grow spiritually? Those things are all good. Those things all have a place in spiritual growth but they're not the ideal way to grow spiritually. That study concluded of the people who did have a significant relationship with Jesus, of the people who did have a functioning faith that they lived out practically in their daily life, of those people overwhelmingly, by and large, the difference makers that made their spiritual life more healthy than anyone else was that they were in the scriptures daily, that they read God's word and applied it to their life daily. And so for my time this morning, what I I, I wanna do is I just wanna encourage you and maybe even challenge you. Are you getting into this text? Are you reading these words? Are you hearing the the word of God in your life through what's written on these pages? And and, and I say that because this is where it boils down to. This is not just an ordinary book. This is not a book just to be read and consumed. Well, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way, and I love it, because it says that this book is the word of God, and what it says is this. It says, for the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. What the writer of Hebrews wants you to know is that this is not just a book for you to read. This is a holy text for you to allow into your heart to read you, to assess you, to grow you. And I wonder how many of us have silenced the word of God in our lives because we don't even engage with his text. And I know this is important. That's not my opinion. I know this is important because I can see in scripture how Jesus engaged with the scriptures. In Matthew chapter four, let me set the scene for you. Uh, Jesus is beginning his ministry on this earth. Jesus was was born of a virgin. We could read that in scripture. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. Luke uh, 2.52, we could read that in scripture. And Matthew chapter four, what you get to is a point in Jesus' life where he's about 30 years old. 
and he's baptized by John the Baptist. Upon his baptisms, the heavens opened up, the Holy Spirit descends upon him as a dove. It says that the Lord spoke, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And once that takes place, Jesus begins his ministry on this earth. It is from this point on that Jesus is gonna heal the sick. It is from this point on that Jesus is gonna raise the dead. It's from this point on that Jesus is gonna do his miracles. He's gonna teach as one with authority. And the very first thing that Jesus does in Matthew 4, upon, upon beginning his ministry, is he goes out and he fasts and he prays in the wilderness. And what happens immediately is Jesus is attacked by evil itself. Jesus is attacked by Satan. Satan tries to tempt Jesus, tries to get him to falter, tries to trick and mislead Jesus to get him to sin. The first temptation we see is, is Satan shows up and says, Jesus, you must be hungry. You must be you know, starving. Why don't you take some of these rocks and use your power to turn them into bread so that you can nourish your own desires? And look how Jesus responds to that temptation. Matthew chapter four, verse four Jesus answered, look at these three words. It is written. Jesus doesn't say, well, I think I, no, no, no. He says, it is written. And then he quotes, holy scripture. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. When evil was in the face of Jesus, Jesus himself used scripture to face that evil, to thwart that evil, to stop that evil from leading him astray. Now, what gives me pause as a pastor and, and as a, someone who cares for this church and each and every one of you in this room and your spiritual growth, what gives me a great deal of pause is what happens in two verses later. Look at verse six. In verse six, this is not Jesus speaking anymore. This is Satan speaking. Satan himself going to in again, trying to tempt Jesus again. Satan says this, well, if you are the son of God, he said, then throw yourself down and look at these three words. For it is written. And then he goes on to say, he will command his angels convey concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Do you know where that's written? That's Psalm 91. Satan was quoting scripture, misquoting scripture, out of context to trick Jesus into sinning. Wouldn't it be a shame if Satan knew more scripture than you? Have you read Psalm 91? Satan has. Here's how... How my mind kind of thinks about this too, because I, I think about that, the fact that Satan knows scripture and he could bend scripture and misquote scripture and use it as a tool against us. But we're, my mind thinks about this, like as you read through the Bible, what you read about these different attributes of God, like he's all powerful and that's one of his attributes, that he's all knowing, you know? And, and, and I think about God being all knowing, he knows everything. But when you read the Bible, Satan doesn't get those same attributes. Satan's not all powerful and Satan's not all knowing. Which means at some point, like, like Satan had to spend like a couple weekends like, all right, let's, let's read this thing. Let's see what they're saying here. Oh, he's throwing some serious shade at me. You know, like it's like, <laughs> I mean, Satan had to read scripture. Satan had to take time. He had to, he had to engage with the scripture so that he knew it well enough to be able to twist it, manipulate it, and use it as a tool against us. And so what we want to do is we want to be a church that we can beat Satan at that game. We wanna be a church that, that understands what God is saying in our lives. We wanna be men and women who are not gonna be easily led astray by evil because we know the ultimate truth of the good word of God. In fact, here at 242, this is the way we talk about it. We believe at 242 that the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, we believe that it is infallible. We believe it is trustworthy and true. We believe that it is the baseline to what we believe as a church and what we do as Christ followers. We put all of that on scripture. I can't tell you how many times people call our church offices or they'll email me and they'll, they'll be like, hey Brad, well, what, does, what does 242 believe about this? What does 242 think about that? What's 242 stance on this? And you can fill in the blanks however you want. I get those questions all the time. 
What's 242 say about whatever? And the way I answer that is the same every single time. What the Bible says, according to our understanding, is this. It's not what 242 believes. What does 242 believe about? Who's 242? What do you even mean? The Bible says this. This is what we, the Bible says this, so we'll teach it this way because this is our understanding of Scripture. Now, if you have a different understanding of Scripture, let us sit down and you can show me your, where you came from, from your understanding. I'll show you where I came from, from my understanding. And we can, you know, grow and we can understand the Bible better. But for us, it all hinges on Scripture. And we're not taking any stances that the Bible doesn't take a stance on. So we speak where the Bible speaks. We're silent where the Bible is silent. And we preach the Word of God, not our opinions. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 puts it this way. It says this, all scripture, the apostle Paul says this, all scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, I say that, and like, you can even look at that, that verse. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. And some of you in the room are like, amen, yeah. But look at that list, honestly. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, training. Uh, Nope, 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 and nope. Those aren't fun things. Nobody enjoys those things. You don't wake up early in the morning with your your coffee and open your Bible like, can't wait to be rebuked today. (laughs) Can't wait for the Lord to rebuke me for squeezing the toothpaste in the middle. (laughs) He won't, that's not in scripture but you should feel ashamed. (laughs) But that's part of scripture. Part of the purpose of scripture is to train us, to teach us, to rebuke us when we're getting off course. It's to show us the truth and the way that God would have us to live. Now, we believe that as a church leadership. I believe that as a Christ follower myself. And I can say that from the stage with boldness and confidence. Now, I know in a room this size, there's many of you who may be skeptical and you say, well, that's just how, how could a book written centuries ago apply to our lives today and, and be any kind of source of truth and reason today? And I get it. I was at the same place you were. I was a very skeptical person before I became a Christ follower. I wasn't raised in a church. I wasn't raised going to church. I had to wrestle with those same things. And I would just encourage you to do that. Wrestle with that. Wrestle with that. Because here's the thing. Even if you strip this book of its divinity, which I would never do personally, but even if you did, you have to realize this text is unlike any other text in the history of humanity. The Bible is a completely unique book. And you have to ask yourself, why? I mean, let me point some out to you. I mean, you can you study this more in depth on your own, but you need to understand that the Bible, I mean, it's unique in its composition. The way that it's put together is completely unique. In fact, it's not a book, it's a collection of books. It's a library of books, some poetry, some history, some narrative, all put together, written by, in fact, it's 66 books all together, written by 44 different authors. Now I say that and some of you are like, gotcha. You just said 44 different authors, 44 different human beings wrote that book. And here's what I was saying. I believe 44 different human beings put pen to paper, wrote this book, absolutely. But I believe they were all inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And I believe that because those 44 people, they they weren't like in a room together, like, hey, what part are you putting in yours? I'm gonna add that to mine too. Okay, this is gonna be great. (laughs) People are gonna lose their mind about this walk on water part. (laughs) 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 You need to realize This collection of books was put together by 44 different authors over a span of 1,600 years in three different languages on three independent different continents. And yet it tells one cohesive, agreeable story of God's redemption of the world he created unto himself from beginning to end. Now, I don't know how you explain that if it's not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because here's the thing, if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna do a test, you, you're fine, 
If you believe it was written by 44 human beings, not inspired by the Holy Spirit, then fine, here's the test. Do this yourself, okay? Go home, go on amazon.com, pick any topic, I don't care, whatever one floats your boat. Find 44 different books on that topic and tell me how much agreement are in those books. I can tell you right now, they're not gonna agree. I know that because I had a baby. <laughs> Have you read baby books? Woo! Baby books are like, let the baby cry. No, pick the baby up. No, lay it on its back. No, always on its belly. Ah! Like, The books don't agree, why? Because they're written by different human beings who have different personal opinions based on what they individually think, whatever. But this was written by 44 people and it's in agreement, right? Over the span of 1600 years, do you wanna raise your child by a baby book from just 200 years ago? Your baby's crying, give us some opium. What, no! But yet, over the span of 1,600 years, three different languages, three different continents, these 44 people were inspired by God, I would claim, wrote a book that it was cohesive. It's very unique in its composition, okay? The second thing you need to realize is this. It's also very unique in its circulation. This text has withheld the, sta the, the, the test of time unlike any other. The, the Bible is, is, is so widely circulated today. It's so widely circulated, circulated today that in the 2013 Huffington Post article, they found that 80% of Americans have a Bible in their home. 80% of Americans, not, not Christians, Americans, all Americans have a Bible in their home. Find someone you know, a family member, a loved one, a coworker who hates God, who's an atheist, who wants nothing to do with the church. Just ask them, do you like God? No. Do you have a Bible in your house? I do. I don't know how it got there. It just showed up. 80% <laughs> of Americans have a Bible in their home. It's one of the most pervasive texts in the world. It, it, and, and here's the thing. And it's not like people try, you know, haven't tried to stop it. There have been several efforts to stop the distribution of Scripture. It's going on right now in China. It's gone on over many countries over many years. In fact, in Rome, in the 300 AD, the emperor declared that anyone who has any scripture upon them will be executed. When I said people try to stop the spread of this book, I'm not talking about like, hey, let's take the kill mockingbird out of the library. It's a little intense for kids. No, no, no. This was, if you're caught with any part of a Bible, you will be executed and that will be destroyed. And that was an edict from the emperor that was t taken out in practice and yet it did not destroy the word of God. It spread despite that. In fact, it spread so much that today, even if you were to destroy every copy of the Bible today, the Bible itself has been quoted in so many other literary works that the Bible could be recreated just on the quotes from other works of literature. The Bible is at a point today that is so pervasive it cannot be removed from society. It is unique in, in, in that circulation. No other book has that kind of distribution. And then finally, I'll say this. The Bible is very unique in its criticism. And when I say that, I mean, I mean literary criticism. Uh, and what literary criticism is, it's, it's the process by which we could tell the validity of historical texts. Now, here's the thing. We live in the age of Google. I can't get away with standing up here and lying to any of you. The truth is, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'll own up to it. We do not have any of the original manuscripts of the Old Testament or the New Testament. We don't have any of the original manuscripts. We have old manuscripts, but none of the original. But guess what? We also don't have any of the original manuscripts from the writings of Plato, any of the original manuscripts from the writing of Aristotle, any of the original manuscripts from the writing of Homer, any original manuscripts from a myriad of people who we hold as great scholars. And yet no one doubts their work, but for some reason we just throw the Bible out. No, no, no. All those texts go through the same process called literary criticism where they look into it and they say from the earliest manuscripts that we have, where, where can we see if what's agreeable, what's not agreeable, what's out of alignment, what's not, and they put together what is accurate and what is inaccurate. And, and, and we, 
just have no problem with writing Aristotle's, who from the early, last manuscript that he wrote to the earliest manuscript that we have, it was a span of 1,400 years. But we have no problem believing those to be true. We have no problem with the Iliad being accurate, even though the last, from the last copy that he wrote to the first copy we have, it's been 500 years. But do you realize that is the exact same as our Old Testament. From our Old Testament in our Bible, from the last incident that took place to the first document that we have, it's a span of 500 years, exact same as the Iliad. And in the New Testament, from the moment it took place to the earliest manuscript we have, it's only 23 years. The Bible holds up to literary scrutiny. So you have to do something with this text. And what I would suggest you do is read it. What I would suggest you do is wrestle with it. What I would suggest you do is that you apply it and you allow it to, to, to empower you to face exactly what Jesus faced, which is evil in this world. And that's why this is so important to me. It's not that you have Bible studies. That's not what's important to me. What's important to me is that you and I are equipped to do what God called us to do. And it's so important to me because we have an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. And now it's even at this point, I have to take a pause from what I even planned on saying for the rest of the sermon and I just have to address the evil that has been so pervasive this week. You cannot turn on your TV, you cannot start up your computer without hearing about the evil that took place by Larry Nasser. In our own backyard, evil was happening. And this week, if you've seen any of the accounts of these women who were victimized by this abuser, these survivors who were trying to find strength in, 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 in their community, but, but they, they had to, many of them had took the opportunity to go to that court and face their abuser and let him know how their abuse affected them. And they could speak directly to him. And so I'm watching these women step up one after another, sharing. And then this one lady stood up. A young woman named Rachel Denhollander. And she noticed something. I mean, her whole statement is about an hour long. So, so you can go online if you, if you want to watch her whole statement. But, but she noticed something. That this man who was doing evil, that was on trial justly for the evil he did, was walking in and out of the courtroom carrying a Bible. And she knew what was in the Bible. So when she got an opportunity to speak, she gave some of her opinion but she also told the truth of God's word. And I watch Rachel and I do a soul check on myself. Do I have that strength to stand on his word? In the face of evil, do I have that resolve? And I ask us as a church, do we have that? The Bible points out what is good. It points out what is good so that you and I can be in this world that has sin in it, that has evil in it. And you and I can stand up as a force of good against that evil. That the, the church should always call out evil, should always shine a light on darkness. It should always do that. Whether that's happening in a, in a, in a hospital uh, room, whether that's happening on a college campus, whether that's happening in a workplace, whether that's happening in the leadership of our church itself, we should always hold to the teachings of God's word that, and call for justice where there is injustice. But that will only happen for our community if we as individuals collectively read this word, ingest this word, equip ourselves with this word to take that into this dark world. That's why I would suggest, even standing here today, it is not enough for you just to be near a Bible. 80% of America does that. It's not even enough for you to own a Bible. It's not enough for you to, I would even say, to study a Bible. The hope of this world is that you and I would live the Bible. 
that we would live the words of Jesus, the words of the gospel, the word gospel itself is translated as good news, that you and I are supposed to be men and women of good news in a world that is broken, in a world that is dying, in a world that is under attack by the same tempter that tempted Jesus, and so many people are falling for his traps, and you and I are called to be better than that, to be bolder than that. You and I are called to stand up against that. In fact, Jesus says that if his gathering, if his ecclesia, the church, would live by his word, then he says that the gates of hell will not be able to withstand his church. And and I stand up here and I say that with boldness because it breaks my heart when I read statistics about crowds of people who attend worship services, but then I see so few people committed to their faith. So at 242, you need to understand, we're, we're, we're always gonna be the first people in line for fun. At 242, you need to understand, we're all gonna help you take your next steps with God. We're not asking you to read this book and go, oh, I'm gonna be perfect tomorrow. No, but we're always gonna challenge you. Are you willing to take your next step? And if you're willing, then we wanna help you take that together. And I believe if we could get better at that, if we could grow in the four areas of the RPM, specifically spiritually today, then we could shine in our community. And this could be a community of light, of love, of hope, of healing, and prayerfully that would echo even further in Southeast Michigan and to the world. That is what God called us to do. The answer is will we answer that call? When Jesus left this earth, the mission that he gave his disciples, his disciple is anyone who follows him, so I believe that it applies to each of us today. The mission he gave us was to go into the world to make other disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says this, and teach them to obey what I have taught you. But you cannot teach what you have not learned. And if you are silencing the voice of God in your life, you're not going to continue to grow to be the person God wants you to be. So let us encourage one another. Let us equip one another Let us live out our faith and show this world that God is still moving today.